Hi, I'm Cayman Reynolds. Let's talk about fall swarming, abscons. I'm telling you what. Anyways, this is a topic that if you don't understand, you're doomed to repeat it again the next year. And there's a lot of stuff when you're a new beekeeper that you just don't understand because either no one sat down and explained it to you or you're just reading or listening to the wrong information. I was one of those people at one time. It's very easy to do, especially if it kind of fits the mentality that you already have. For me, I was already doing a lot of organic raised chickens, CSAs, farmers markets. I really like the idea of organic. I also like the idea of breeding for better bees, which we still do. And so treatment free was something that I started off with very quickly in beekeeping because I didn't have anybody that was successful around me. Everyone around me at the time was buying bees every year. So as a new beekeeper, I didn't want to be like that. And I didn't want to fall into that trap, but I ended up falling into it anyways. And it took me several years to figure out what the problems were. And I know this video is going to be maybe more boring than getting into a hive and tearing it apart, but this is very, very important. So this might take a little while. Fall swarming and absconding is not normal as far as hives just completely up and leaving the colony. There's something wrong. Bees don't do that that time of the year. Now, I will have some fall swarming if we have a really good nectar flow and our colonies are very large and we haven't split them. But usually fall swarms for me are around two to three frames of bees. They're not like spring swarms where they're just like 60% or so of the hive and they're just these massive swarms. The, the fall swarms are very different, but we're not talking about that because even with those fall swarms, our hives still have plenty of bees left over to manage the brood nest. And they don't just leave themselves completely vulnerable. Or they just don't up and leave the hive altogether, which is what a lot of people are experiencing. I personally believe that most winter deaths are a result of poor management in late summer. And, and many other professional beekeepers will tell you the same. What happens is the varroa mites and especially the viruses take hold of your counties. And we'll, we'll get into more details on this later, but we're going to sum up some of it right now. Let's say you treated in spring. And this, again, this is going to depend on your area to a degree. You'll still be able to learn something from it. But here in Tennessee, I treat in winter, oxalic acid vapor, and then as soon as the honey supers are pulled off, we treat again, making sure that we knock the mites back. But what if they're at a 1% mite level? Some of them are going to be in the zeros, but some of them are going to still be around a 1% after we treated them in June. Well, in July, until about 21 days later, they're going to be at 2%, no problem. Towards August, they're at least going to be around 4%. Now, there's going to be some outlying colonies in both directions. And this isn't always just, ooh, these are super bees. Well, it might be they went through a super seizure, and that brood break slowed down the varroa being able to reproduce. The mites only live so long, so brood breaks are a little rough on them. And we'll get into more into that later. However, there are some variables at work here. So you might end up with one colony that has, in August, already a mite load of eight, and you might have some that are down in the threes and the twos. Who knows? And that's where the alcohol wash comes in really handy. And you know, I don't like doing it any more than anybody else. One, it takes me a lot of time to do it. But then again, for the amount of work that we put into it, we, we save so many hives of bees because we understand which ones are our problem colonies. Also helps us selectively breed for colonies that show a little bit more resistance for whatever reason. So there's that to watch out for. But hey, we're just in August. Our bees are, gonna, are still brooding a little bit here in October. Not a whole lot, but a little bit. So that means we have at least two or three more brood cycles, pretty much three from the beginning of August. So our mites can go from coming out of the honey flow to mite levels in the 20s on an alcohol wash going into September and October. And your bees are toast. A couple of colonies will survive that, but they're not going to be able to do anything next year. And some of you have experienced this. Hopefully some of you will never experience this, but you can have colonies that will come out of winter, and that's what I'm kind of suspicious is going to happen to that one with the 94 mite count load that we were doing experiments on for treatment free. Woohoo! That didn't work out very good on that colony. It was a wild swarm, but hey, they didn't have any resistance whatsoever. So they're probably going to come out of winter, and they're just not going to build up. The virus loads are too high, and you'll have colonies that had the same you know, there's like a five-frame new coming out of winter that are clean and healthy, and they'll just blow up and 
do all the things that a good healthy colony should and you'll have some colonies you just look at them and the, the brood spotty you can requeen them but won't fix it and you can requeen them again or they can requeen themselves and won't fix it you have virus problems you can take all the mites out of the equation at that point but the viruses have made so many copies inside of the bees themselves and just get spread from one bee um, and, and honestly if it gets into the queen which I believe it does I mean, if it gets in the rest of the bees, it could get in the queen, then every one of her eggs is going to have virus copies in it as well. High virus copies, potentially, and, and you know, then you're going to lose a lot of brood. So I know we're getting a little technical here a little bit, kind of, in a rough way. But so the reason your bees probably absconded in fall, 99 times out of 100, is because the varroa mites got out of control and then the viruses went crazy. Because what happens in fall and summers, the nutrition starts going down towards the end of the season. The mite population has been going up, the bee population goes down. So if you have a 20% mite infestation or whatever the number is, if the bee population naturally is going to decline down in half, well that's automatically twice as bad. Plus if you have a combination of poor nutrition, bees that are not fed as healthy as spring bees live a week or two less anyways, even if there's no mites in the hive, because they don't get fed as much as larvae. So this is in impacting the longevity of, our, the longevity of our bees. It's also going to impact the immune system of our bees. I mean, obviously, if you have a better diet, you're going to be a little bit more resilient to things. So it's a, just a combo punch, and most people don't realize that, oh, I treated good in the spring. And then I threw in a couple oxalic acid vapor rounds in there to boot. And we've tested it quite a bit, and oxalic acid vapor is very handy. And I would not go without the tool. I really like it. But just like all of them, it has limitations. And plus, even if you knock them back good with it, within three months, you can be in a really critical state. And that is why it is so important to monitor your mite loads, understand your season. What they have to do in Canada is not near as much as what we have to do here in regards to mite treating, mite treating, mite treating. I, I feel like I need at least three good kills a year in order to keep my mites at bay and my colony is just looking like champs. Yeah, I know some beekeepers that are up in the northern part of the United States and they do an oxalic acid vapor in winter when they're broodless and then they do a really good treatment after they pull honey supers and that's all they do. You know what? And that probably works very well for them. Could you imagine being down in the southern part of Florida? I think you're going to have to treat a lot more. Now I know some people are, are really into treatment free and I used to do that as well. I have purchased from those treatment free beekeepers, some of them that are very famous, I'm not here to name names, but I've tried Minnesota Hygienics as well, I've tried USDA Russians, I've tried the Guru Bees, I've tried uh, multiple types of VSH, I've tried raising my own stock for years from only the survivors, obviously. We've tried swarms that look different from our bees and that are in trees, and you know what? The mites are pretty rough in the bees. And if we want colonies that not only survive, but actually turn into multiple colonies, either one cell or expand our apiary for more honey production, and just to give our bees the best chance of survival, because we don't want to lose any of them, then those mites have got to die. And it's just part of the game, but probably why you lost your bees 99 times out of 100 is because they absconded due to high virus loads. And, and let me explain this as well. So what happens when a bee gets a lot of viruses in its system. It is programmed to get itself away, and it's not just viruses, it's also some diseases that will do this as well. They get this in their body, and they run themselves out of the colony, and they're trying to get that away from the hive. It is a natural programmed instinct into the bee, which is a noble thing for the bee to do to sacrifice itself. The problem is, if those mite loads get high in winter, nutrition goes down, population goes down, everything gets really out of balance, and you have a lot of bees that are infected and it just goes vi viral through your colony. And you're not going to see just like this huge swarm taken off into the sky. No, it's just going to be bee after bee after bee running itself out of the hive. And not all at one time. But they just, they go out and they throw themselves out 100 feet, 200 feet, 50 feet from the hive and they die in the grass and trying to get those viruses out of the hive. And sometimes you'll still see a little bit of bees left in there with the queen and those are nurse bees that have hatched out and there's just you'll see honey in there you'll see all kinds of stuff left in there and it's um it's very frustrating but don't be confused anymore 
take care of those mites. And if you monitor them using the alcohol wash or something else, that probably won't work near as good. Unfortunately, that's what we have right now. Some people are exper experimenting with the CO2 and saying that, that might be promising. Uh, we'll see. Ultimately, as much as I don't like it, the alcohol wash is the best way to follow what is happening in your hive in relationship to the mites. And even though, yes, you sacrifice a few bees, I know a lot of people don't like it. Again, I don't like it. However, bees were designed to be expendable. I know you ain't going to like that either. But if you study bees, that is exactly what they're made for. They're made to be expendable. They don't live that long. And, you know, when they're working hard, they might live six weeks. And then, at the end of the season, all the old bees, even if they're not, even if it's before their time, they throw themselves out of the colony because they're just burning up resources in the hive. And you'll see piles of bees in front of your hives, and not from pesticide poisoning, but just because they don't need those old bees anymore. And so they chuck themselves out. Bees are designed to be expendable. And while I'm not saying that we just need to go around crushing bees mindlessly, at the same time, if you give your bees proper bee husbandry and take care of them just like you would anything else, taking care of cows or horses or your pets or your children, I hope, you are going to give them the best that you can. doesn't mean we always breed from the weak ones because we definitely don't want to do that. But at the same time as a hobby, you got to focus on just keeping your hobby alive, helping it pay for itself and keeping it going. No one wants to do a hobby where they lose money every year and especially a lot of money, which you can do in beekeeping. As we do more of our videos, we're going to be targeting stuff that's going to help you hopefully save money. More importantly, keeping your bees alive because if your bees are healthy and alive, they're going to make lots of honey. You're going to be able to make splits with them and you're going to at least break even, depending on how much you blow on all the bee knickknacks. I'm a little guilty there, but Laurel's not helping me with this video, so she doesn't have to giggle and point out all the things I've bought that were stupid over the years. I probably ought to do a video on just all the knickknacks I've got lying around. But anyways, take care of those mites. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up beekeeping. I've lost a lot more bees than you probably ever will. And we're just now getting to the point where um, you know, we're sharing that information with others. And I, I hope that it truly helps you out much quicker than it did us. Because it took us probably four or five years to really get a solid beekeeping operation going. And that was at a hobby scale at that level. But now here we are. I'm just my 17th year almost into beekeeping. And, um, you know, things are going a lot better for us. But it costs a lot of money and a lot of time. And I think our bee videos will help you miss a lot of those years of frustration that we went through. And hopefully you won't give up. Don't give up. Try it again. Put out some swarm traps. We're going to be having some videos and with more detail on swarm trapping coming out around January. So stay tuned for that. Always, thanks for watching our videos.